Good morning. morning. It's so good to see you all. I hope that you are doing well on your faith journey with God and uh, are ready to hear some things that God has for you this morning. So before we begin, let's bow our heads and let's welcome God's presence among us. Father, we know that you were already here before we even opened our eyes to get up this morning and come over here, but you, Father, meet us at all the places where we are. And today, Father, we are looking to you to speak to our hearts and to our minds so that we, Father, may know the good news of the gospel, that it will be refreshed in us and that our faith will be strengthened and that we will gain boldness for the journey so that we will speak out the goodness that you have shown to us with gratitude. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. I want to speak this morning on Jesus, our identity, and uh, Romans chapter 8, because I often feel like uh, when we talk about the gospel, we're not always clear about what the Bible is saying, what the gospel is. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul gets the heart of it as he uh, is bringing a conclusion to one of the things that he's teaching here to the ch- Ro- church in Rome. He says in, in verse 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified those he justified, he also glorified. Let's start with Christmas. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest books on transformation that is out in the fictional world is Christmas Carol. And we all know that story. It's been made over in the movies, and it's been read almost every Christmas time. And you know what happens is that Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, is a miserly, miserable man at the beginning of the story, and through a process, he becomes a changed man at the end. He becomes a good man, and it's kind of like, it's, uh, like wow, this is, this is transformation. This is what it looks like when people are transformed. Well, I want to tell you something, that that story is not just about Ebenezer Scrooge, but it's about the people who influenced his life, because if you look at it, you know, there is no transformation until he re- thinks his life in terms of his sister, Fanny, and the goodness in her life. And, and, and Fezziwig, who was a kind and good master he served under. And even Bob Cratchit in his life and how he refuses to be bitter towards Ebenezer Scrooge, even though his son's dying. And without these characters, transformation is meaningless. You know, what, what is he being transformed into is the question. And when we come to the gospel, we say, you know, Jesus has come to transform our life. And then we're transformed by the gospel. Well, without Jesus, that statement is absolutely meaningless. You know? Uh, Jesus is more than just our example. He is our true identity. When we look at Jesus, we're seeing ourselves. This is who we are. Okay? Okay? Um, what is the gospel? You know, when we we say the gospel, what do we mean by that? That's a great word, but what does it mean? Because it's good news about Jesus Christ. And the thing about the gospel is is that I grew up with a version of the gospel in the church because I grew up in the church, and the version of the gospel kind of went like this. God is good, you're bad, stop it. (laughs) And I got an adult version of that when I went to Bible college. It was basically saying, you know, people are sinners and they're miserable and if they don't believe in Jesus they're going to go to hell and that to me was the gospel we want we didn't want people to go to hell we wanted them to go to heaven but that's not all the gospel and in fact uh, you know I I I began to understand that you know as I read this passage that Paul is capturing a part of the gospel that's often left out which is this that God has already decided ahead of time to conform us to the likeness of his son 
that he might be the firstborn among, and in the original language, it translates siblings. What does it mean? What does this mean? Well, it means this, that, that God has already decided ahead of time that all those who belong to him are going to become like Jesus. But when he talks about Jesus in this passage, when Paul talks about Jesus in this passage, he's not talking about Jesus as deity. A lot of times we look at this and say, well, you know, when we get to heaven, we'll be like Jesus and we'll be like the angels and we'll fly around and do things, you know. But what, he is say, what Paul has already talked about in chapter 5, verses 12 through chapter 6, verse 6, is that Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is the last man. Jesus is Adam as Adam was intended to be before the fall. When we look at Jesus, we're seeing humanity in a way that has not been seen since the day that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God has already determined ahead of time that he is going to conform us to that likeness. So when we look at Jesus, we're saying, what, what are we to be like? And we can go through the Bible and we read things like um, in Hebrews 4, 15, that he was tempted in every way we are tempted, yet without sin. That's what it means to be like Jesus. Or Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5, where this great hymn of the faith talks about that our attitude should be like that of Jesus, who though being in the likeness of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but emptied himself and in, in humi humility surrendered himself to God's plan for his life. Here is a man who understood that in my role of what God has called me to be, I'm humbled myself under God's hand and I'm accepting whatever he wants me to do. Or Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, where it talks about Jesus, who for the joy before him scorned the shame and finished the race, set down the right hand of the Father. Said, Enduring whatever it takes to be what you want me to be. Or maybe we can look in Luke chapter 20, 23, verse 24, 34 where Jesus is being nailed on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And Peter talks about this in his first letter where he says in chapter 2 that Jesus has, is an example for us in our suffering that we should follow in his steps. See, when we begin to look at Jesus and we look through the Bible, we see Jesus having compassion on people who don't deserve compassion. Yeah. We see Jesus being willing to be called names by the religious establishment, drunkard and glutton, because he knew that there were sinners who needed him more than ever in this world. That's the way that Jesus lived his life. That's the, that's the example. That's our identity. And, you know, we're not just looking at Jesus and saying how cool Jesus is. We're saying that's exactly what God has intended me to become. When I look at Jesus, I'm seeing myself. You know, and I know that um, you might be saying, I have nothing like Jesus. And I looked at the mirror this morning, and I, I didn't have, uh, you know, and I do this. I do think about this. You know, Steve, you haven't become like Jesus yet. And Shirley can say that about me with more conviction And I don't need the church to tell me so. Because I have a backstage view of myself. I look at myself and I know the truth about myself. That I, I wasn't Ebenezer Scrooge, but I was messed up. I was 30 years old when I entered into a transformational journey with God. I was already uh, grown up, uh, been in the Lord for, at that point, um, 22 years and grew up in the church and had Bible teachers for parents and didn't do the Teenage Rebellion show and I, I went to Bible college and prepared and went to seminary and prepared myself for ministry. I was two years as a senior pastor and I had never entered into a, a transformational journey with God. And I had all kinds of stuff, addictions and, and, and lies going on in my life that I was living, you know, keeping, trying to manage it. You know what I'm saying. And I, uh, I knew 
that I was in trouble. And Shirley knew I was in trouble. I mean, every three months I wanted to quit. I'm, I'm in ministry here. I'm supposed to be teaching people how to follow Jesus. I haven't got the foggiest idea how to do it myself. You know, you, you preach really prepackaged sermons, you know what I mean? You, you're just kind of, uh, you know, these are truths I don't know any, anything about, but hopefully you'll get it, you know. And, uh, somebody tell me what I just said, please, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, you know, so, I mean, this is the point that God brought me to self. And I did what everybody else does in this circumstance, you know, that when we're, con we're, we're confronted with our lack of, of deep uh, spiritual transformation in life, what we do is we, we, we invent our ourselves. We reinvent ourselves. We package ourselves. Hopefully I can create a Steve that's acceptable and adequate in this world. David Benner in his book, um, The Gift of Being Yourself, said, we discover the art of packaging ourselves. So we learn to talk the religious language. We learn how to come to church and act in certain ways in front of other people that we want to impress with our spirituality. Including pastors. I remember the pastor's wife who said to her husband, he said, she said, could we do it differently this morning? Can we be pleasant at home and angry at church? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and so we have too close to home there, you know. We're kind of like the, uh, we're like the character that Leo, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio plays in Catch Me If You Can. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you need me to be an airline pilot, I'll be an airline pilot. If you need me to be a doctor, I'll be a doctor. If you need me to be a lawyer, I'll be a lawyer. But it doesn't have any reality. You know, you need me to be a Christian, I'll be a Christian. Whatever that's supposed to look like. But we're holding ourselves together with string and Elmer's glue. And these things are coverings and camouflages for the real person that God loves. See, God loves us, and he's already decided ahead of time that we're going to look like Jesus. Now, nothing God decides doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? We can go willingly, we can go kicking and screaming, but it's going to happen. You know. and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I look at this and I say that, you know, what conforming to Jesus really is about is stripping away from me everything that is not Jesus. It's taking away the camouflage and the facade and the lies that I'm living. And how this happens in our lives is through transformational knowing. Okay? There is, this is not a neutral, I'm in neutral, God's going to do this to me kind of thing. It is a, an engagement with God by which our minds align with truth of God. And this is why God... Is, has us on this journey because, you know, this journey is, is lifelong. This is not something that's going to happen in a moment. Some of you are saying, I'm still messed up and I'm old, you know. But you know what? I'm old and I'm still messed up except this. I know that God has already decided he's going to do this to me, right? Because he said, you know, because there's a point in which I came into the faith. There, this is the point we call justification. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. We were justified. Those he called he justified, that means I was saved from the penalty of sin. That means that somebody else is bearing the penalty for my sin. That's Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness. And there's a day coming when I will be saved. I will be glorified. That is a time when I'm saved from the very presence of sin. I will no longer see sin because I will be in the presence of God Jesus, either through death or the return of Christ. So between this point and this point is the life that I'm living. This is the lifeline that's going on here. And right now, I'm being saved from the power of sin. And sin is powerful. This is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in my life to do for me what I can't do for myself. And God's already decided that this is going to happen. And what I need is to have my mind align with God's truth. This is what transformational knowing is because you see, not all knowing is transformational. 
Yeah, I can know things about myself and say it's too bad I'm that way, and then I'll come up with a good cover story for that. You know, like I told the story, and you don't need me to repeat it about being an angry man. And so my cover story was, well, I'm from a German home. You know, Germans have high tempers and that, you know, we come up with a cover story. The reason I act that way is because this happened to me or that, that people won't let me be good or something. Or it's okay that I act this way, but just don't you do it. Then we say that to our children. Do as I say, not as I do, you know, which never works, okay, because we're role modeling them how to live the life. And see, I believe that transformational knowing comes through relationship. In this case with Jesus Christ. I, you know, I've been married for, th uh, this year will be 38 years in June. Yeah, yeah. She's put up with me that long. And uh, she loves me, and I know she loves me. But you know why God allowed us to marry each other? It's because he wanted us to suffer together. Because you see, <laughs> because you see, as I tell people, as I tell people when they come to me for marriage counseling, I'm a terrible counselor, okay? So people come to me for marriage counseling, and I say to them, the reason why God lets you get married is so you can grow up some more. Because you'll never gain maturity by yourself. Usually they show up when they're about to think that their marriage should depart from each other, you know? And, and I'm saying... You know what? If you do that, you won't learn the lessons of maturity that you need to learn of how to be married. Because, you're not, because it's not because of who you married, it's because who you are that you're at this point and who she is at this point. And both of you need to understand that God is giving you a chance to grow up some more. See, we mature in relationship because in relationship we learn things about we understand things about ourselves we have to face things about ourselves that we wouldn't face before the primary example of this in the new testament is peter with jesus you think about peter and jesus because peter was a fisherman and very successful fisherman probably and it's a family business and he was he and his brother andrew and james and john and sons of Zebedee probably were in business together there on the Sea of Galilee, at least knew each other fairly well. Jesus comes along, calls him, he says, Peter, your name is Simon, Simon Barjona, I'm going to give you a name Peter. It's kind of a joke, okay? We don't get the joke, because Peter means rock. And anything about Peter, it suggests that he wasn't that, okay? But one of the first encounters that Jesus has with with him um, that, that sub substantial is the day that Luke talks about when Jesus is preaching to the people and it's so crowded on the beach that he gets into the boat and Peter lets him use it as a platform and he preaches to people until they're done and then he says, you guys catch anything today? And they said, no, nah, no, nah, we've been fishing all night and didn't catch a thing. He says, well, throw your nets out over here. So he throws his nets out. Uh, they were, they were kind of thinking, well, well, let's humor this guy. You know, he doesn't know anything about fishing. But, you know, because you're Jesus, we love you. Uh, we'll do it. And fish came from everywhere. It's like a magnet. But something happened in Peter here. You know, he wasn't like, wow, thanks, Jesus, for the miracle. Or, you know, that's strange. I swear there's no fish in this area. You know, uh, he must have some kind of magical powers or something like that, you know, knowing where the fish are. The fish whisper, whisper or something like that. You know. <laughs> That's not what Peter does at all. He turns around and he falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, depart from me for I am a wicked man. Why? Because suddenly he knows something about himself that he had been unwilling to see outside of this relationship with Jesus that I am not what I claim to be. And I need transformation. And Jesus promises it to him right then and there. You, you're, you're a fisherman, but I, come along, follow me, and I'll make you a fisherman. We'll, we'll change your life. You'll become the Peter you were created to be. Fishing is what you're created to be, but it's not for fish. And this isn't the only time of transformational knowing in Peter's life. As you go through the Gospels, you see it again and again. You see Jesus in the, I mean, Peter in a boat on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. And it's storming. And then they see Jesus walking on the water. And Peter says, hey, if that's you, Jesus, 
I want to come out there and walk with you. Now, this is a really interesting thing because, you know, Jesus is a rabbi. And in the rabbinical tradition, the way you learn to be a rabbi is you follow a rabbi. You're his disciples. You do what the rabbi is doing. If the rabbi is walking on water, then you as a disciple want to walk on water too because that's the way you learn to be a rabbi. See? You do what the rabbi is doing. So Peter's the only one who gets it. If that's you, I want to come out there too because I want to be a rabbi like you, Jesus. So Jesus says, come on. And he gets out and he's walking on the water and suddenly he's overcome with fear and he begins to drown and he calls out, Jesus save me and Jesus saves him. And what does Peter learn about himself at that moment? You see? Or they're on this field trip to Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus is asking them, who do men say that I am? And everybody said, well, you know, Elijah, John the Baptist come back to life, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, I got this one. I got this. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. He's not using his Peter name here. Uh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And immediately Jesus begins to teach them that the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be arrested and beaten and put to death and three days of ride, rise again from the dead and Peter pulls him aside and says hey, look you're freaking us out please stop talking <laughs> about this stuff we don't even understand what you're talking about and what does Jesus say to him get thee behind me Satan like man I just got the gold star and now I am Satan okay something's wrong with me here You see what I'm talking about? You, you learn about yourself in relationship, and the most devastating time of this was the day before Jesus' crucifixion. When they're in the upper room, and Jesus is again talking about his death, which is imminent. And Peter says, I don't know about everybody else in this room, but Jesus, I'm not going to desert you. We're like this, and I'll go to the death with you. And Jesus says, Peter, you don't understand. He says, Satan is asked to sift you like weak, and I'm praying for you. Because here's what's really going to happen, Peter. Before the cock crows tomorrow, you're going to have denied me three times. And you can just imagine Peter saying, you're wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong on that. Because that's the kind of person he was. I, I can imagine, you know, I mean, I don't know what I do in his situation. All I can say is that this is what he did, that the next day, as the cock is crowing, he's cursing Jesus to someone there who has accused him of being a follower. And one of the Gospels records that Jesus is coming across the courtyard at that moment and looks over and catches his eye. And the words die in his mouth and suddenly Peter knows the truth about himself, that I am worse than I ever thought I was. I'm, I am not just a sinful man. I have, I have betrayed my rabbi. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. No. You know what God calls that moment? He calls that one of the all things. All things work together. In all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. Who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? To conform them to the likeness of his son. Everything that happens in your life, good or bad, miserable, stuff we don't want to talk about. All things, when we crash and burn and learn the truth about ourselves, are those transformational knowing moments. God calls that part of the all thing that he is using for good. See? When we talk about good in this passage, the, 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 the passage that pops into my mind beyond that is the only other place where God pronounced anything good, which was in Genesis when he was created. He says, you know what? I'm in the process of recreating you in the likeness of my son. And so what is happening here, I'm going to take and use it as part of that process. 
And Peter, you have finally come to know the reality of yourself. This is a transformational knowing moment. And now we can rebuild you into the likeness of the Son of my Son, Jesus. And you know, while this is going on, Peter, you're going to have to live with this reality. And nothing can separate you from the love of God. See, right after this passage, when Paul, in Romans, when Paul is talking about that God has not only justified, but also glorified, finished the process of salvation as far as he's concerned, he starts talking about, then what can separate us from the love of God? Peter, you crash and burn. You're going to have to live with the fact, what happens after he weeps bitterly? Who shows up? Jesus. When he first resurrects, he says, go tell Peter and the disciples. Paul records over in chapter 15 of Corinthians that when Jesus came back to life, he first appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. He was the first one on Jesus' checklist of once I am out of the grave, I have to appear to Peter because Peter needs to know that as bad as things are in him, he is still mine. And it's reconfirmed in chapter 21 of, of John where Peter says to some of the guys that he used to fish with, I'm going fishing. What is it essentially saying is that I'm done with this disciple thing because it's, it's done. I, I failed. I'm going back to the only life I know, fishing. And so he went out fishing. And while he's out there fishing and they're catching stuff because somebody said, hey, put your nets down on the other side. Where is, you know, do you ever see the picture of something being repeated? How do we first encounter Jesus? Put down the nets. Fish came in. Peter, you've denied me. You've gone back to fishing. Put your nets back down. And guess what? Fish start showing up. And one of the disciples, probably John, says it's the Lord. And he jumps out and he swims the shore. And Jesus has got breakfast there. And he, after breakfast, he reconfirms to Peter you are mine, and you have something to do, and yes, someday you will die for me. The thing that you thought you were going to do this time, you're going to do that. But now it's going to be different. You're going to be Peter. You're not going to be Simon Barjona. You're going to be Peter. And I love you. This is what it means to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. I've come to the end of myself and I've admitted I am not that good. I've been lying to myself that I'm good, that I've got goodness in me, that I've got the strength to be good for God. And God says, no, you don't, but I have given you my spirit. And because my spirit is in you, as you come to transformational moments where you say, I know how bad things are, God says, but now I can do something about that. I'll do it in you. And what does this mean ultimately for us to say that Jesus is our identity? Is that if Jesus is the second Adam, what is it about Adam that we need to regain? See, when you think about this, the first Adam, where was he? He was in the garden. But it wasn't just that he was in the garden or that he had the perfect mate and Eve or that he had a perfect relationship with creation around him, but that he, every day, God came in the cool of the evening and they walked together. See, what, what God is beckoning us on towards is intimacy with him. He's saying, look, as you go through this process of being conformed to likeness of my son, what is regained in your life is this intimacy with me so that you hear me and let me speak into your life and powerfully do things in your life that you need me to do for you. And I recognize that for many of us that seems like such a remote thing. Like, you know, our experience with God is we come here on Sunday, sing songs, hear a sermon, go home. Maybe we read the Bible, maybe we listen to some religious radio, maybe we do some some, uh, some spiritual exercises, but we really don't have that intimacy with God. And I say this morning that the, the calling here always is, 
not what we are doing here on Sunday morning, not what we're hearing here on Sunday morning, but as we go through our week that we're with God. The, I call this the dis done discipline of rest, where we begin to say, God, I'm here with you without an agenda. I know you're with me. If you're with me at the grocery store. You're with me at the uh, water cooler. You're with me in the classroom. You're with me as I'm driving my car in that crazy traffic out there that I hate those people in front of me. But you're with me. Do I have a problem with this? Yes, I do. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul, they say. Okay. But I'm with you without structure. And God, if you lead me to read the scripture, I want to read it in a way that lets you speak to me. It may not be systematic. And God, when I'm with you, I do not want to be with you with a laundry list of of things that I'm going to tell you, but I'm here to listen to what you have to say to me. What do you have to say to me today? And God, I want to see your hand in my life. And, and I want to stop and think about that. And this is what it means to rest, because we're not there trying to push an agenda with God. And Peter was trying to push an agenda with God. It was his agenda. And Jesus was there to introduce him to his own agenda. And say, no, I have something for you, Peter. I've even given you a name. And I'm going to build a church off people like you. Amazing. I'll tell you, when you're on a journey like this with God, when you're able to rest and gain intimacy with him, it powerfully impacts your life. Things that you say, I have no testimony. You know, I used to, I went to church and every, you had people come and give their testimony. They would talk about all that awful sin they did. We think, you know, I never got drunk. I never slept around. I never, you know, did drugs. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I have no testimony. You know, I don't dare get up while I've grown up in church all my life. I believe in Jesus since I was eight. You know, that, wow, that's powerful. <laughs> you know, I tell you, when God begins to get behind the surface, when he gets at the stuff that's really going in your life and he begins to transform your likeness of Jesus, you really have something to say to people. You have some, a testimony to give to people and people start seeking you out. Well, I need to be done. So I'm going to stop right at this point. I'm going to pray for us. Um... Blessings on you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. For the fact that you pursue us. And you will not let us go. For what we learn about through Peter. Thank you for including all that because he's, because you used him mightily with the gospel. Because he became the gospel. His life was a testimony of your transformational power. God, may our lives be like that too. I don't doubt that there are people in this room right here that have that same calling upon their life, but they don't know it because they're so caught up in being religious that they need to be transformed. And I pray, Father, that they would rest in you and trust you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.